Development applications are on the rise. Kensington is poised for change. And county agencies are better managing stormwater. All that and the latest news coming up next on Montgomery Plans. Thanks for watching Montgomery Plans. I'm Michael Brown. We're here to bring you up to date on important land use issues facing those who live and work in Montgomery County. On today's show, we'll look at some new and exciting projects that are coming online faster thanks to a streamlined development review process. Next, we'll visit Kensington to understand how the recently approved sector plan will affect the community's future. And we'll learn about watershed restoration projects being installed along county roads. But first, let's go to the top news-making decisions of the Montgomery County Planning Board. Welcome to Plans in the News. I'm Susan Kennedy. Planners have begun work on the 2012 subdivision staging policy, which will ensure that transportation, school capacity, and other infrastructure keeps pace with growth. Transportation plays a big role in the staging policy. When testing the adequacy of our transportation systems, planners must balance the number of proposed trips against existing roads and transit. Was important in Last year, the county council asked planners to develop a new transportation test, the Transportation Policy Area Review, or TPAR. TPAR will ensure that roads and transit are adequate to serve new residents or anyone traveling to or from a new development. It's a way for us to assure that uh, the facilities that we plan for Montgomery County, the, tr the roads, the transit service, the schools, are paced uh, to cover any growth so that as growth occurs, the services are provided in a timely fashion. Each time an application for new development is brought before the planning board for consideration, planners calculate how much impact each proposal would have on area roads and transit. Most of those in the planning process agree that the current transportation test is confusing and flawed, so in response, planners developed a new TPAR test that is simple to understand and monitor. The, the main thing is we really want to make sure that our citizens and our businesses have the services that they need as we grow. We really don't want to be in a position where we don't have the infrastructure to support our growth. It, it, the two have to, to coincide. Eric Gray is a transportation planner who has been working closely on the TPAR test. He says planners looked at the traffic flow and transit capacity in the county's 30 traffic policy areas and came up with a forecast of how each of these areas might look in 10 years. That's when most of the capital improvements program improvements should be in place. And in this analysis, we assume that all the projects that are in the current capital improvement program are built. Mm -hmm. So it shows that an area like Fairland White Oak, where we see this below the standard, we would say, well, what projects that aren't in the CIP but are in the master plan could be brought to bear to address this problem? Mm -hmm. In this particular analysis, we did not include the interchange at US 29 and Fairland Road. So if we were to include that interchange in the analysis, that would be identifying a potential solution to address this problem that we've identified for this particular area. Achieving balance between development activity and infrastructure is one of the key goals of TPAR. If planners recognize development will exceed road or transit capacity, then developers will have to build new transportation options, from new lanes to carpooling programs. But overall, both Dolan and Gray agree projections for keeping folks moving efficiently in the coming years look pretty good. Are we doing okay here? Are we moving people along like we should be? Basically what it shows is that, that 10 years out, if you, do not, if you don't do anything more than, than what's in the capital program, you are going to have problems in the areas that are below the standards, Potomac, Fairland White Oak, and you see areas that are on the cusp, if you will, like Bethesda Chevy Chase. So overall, you could say that the 10, year, 10 years out from the roadway perspective looks pretty good. Well, it's always a balance between using the roads and services that we have efficiently, using them to their maximum benefit. And in order to do that, sometimes the roads are congested. Other times the roads if you travel in the middle of the day, the road's completely free. So we can't necessarily build uh, to serve the absolute maximum. 
it's not cost effective uh, for the taxpayers. Plans to rezone the Chelsea school site in Silver Spring have been amended. Last fall, the County Council rejected a proposed rezoning for the five-acre school site, which owners want to redevelop into townhouses. When remanded the case earlier this year, the Planning Board reviewed a new plan that reduces the number of townhomes on the site from 76 to 64. According to planners, the changes make the project even better and more compatible with downtown Silver Spring. The hearing examiner has reviewed the case and is prepared to bring it before the council for a second look. It was the proposed density of the plan that led the hearing examiner and the county council to reject the developer's first proposal, 76 townhomes on the edge of downtown Silver Spring. Officials were concerned about the realignment of a private street and how it would affect the historic Riggs Thompson House. The case was remanded by the council back to the planning board. And now in the revised plan, the private street will connect from Ellsworth Drive to Springville Road. Um, so what that will do is increase the green area around the historic Riggs Thompson House on the site, uh, enlarge the environmental setting, or, or keeps the environmental setting as it's stated right now, or as it's designated right now, but increases the green area around the house. To address the concerns of the hearing examiner and the council, the new plan reduces the number of townhomes on the site from 76 to 64. The application continues to be in line with the master plan. In fact, Orobona says, the changes make the project even more compatible with the plan. If anything, it has an increased benefit to the Riggs Thompson House. Now you have uh, the house will be restored, the exterior will be restored, the ground surrounding the property will be uh, enlarged and generously landscaped. Um, I think it will draw more attention to the house and so it will be more of a historic resource for the public as opposed to the, the current school setting. Residents in the area are still concerned about potential cut through traffic with the addition of the private street. However, Orobona says planning staff have looked closely at the plan and are confident additional vehicles in the neighborhood should not be an issue. The staff looked closely at that. Our transportation staff looked at the existing uh, restrictions in the neighborhoods um, and also the, generate, the proposed generation of traffic from these townhomes. And both transportation staff and the planning board were persuaded that that's a very unlikely outcome, that cut through traffic would actually happen at this location given the, the amount of traffic that these townhomes will generate. The council is expected to invite testimony from residents as part of its deliberations on whether the rezoning should be approved. Before any new projects can be built, developers submit a series of plans for review by the planning board. Once those plans are approved, projects can move to construction. Recently, the planning department has seen an uptick in development applications, as well as a shift in the types of projects being proposed. Here's Valerie Burton with more. Anyone moving about in Montgomery County today is bound to see a lot of these. After three years of declining applications, new building construction is picking up. To understand the role the Montgomery County Planning Department plays in the process, I met up with Mark Pefferly near our construction site in downtown Silver Spring. I began by asking him to explain the different plans that must be approved by the planning board before a project can be built. The sketch plan, which is associated with the commercial residential zone, which is CR zone, that essentially is a bubble diagram showing what the heights of the building would be, the mix between residential and commercial, the open space, and also the green space provided with it. The project plan is similar to a sketch plan in many respects. It essentially identifies what will be built on the site. It doesn't get down to the final details. The next plan is a preliminary plan of subdivision, essentially creating the boundaries, let's say the building restriction lines, of where something can be built. Then the next plan is a site plan. The site plan gets the fine details. It gets down to what the property will look like, 
what the subdivision will look like, what the landscaping will be, what the facade of the building will be, how many stories it'll be. It gets down to the fine details. When it's approved, that's when you'll see what we built. Only certain zones require a site plan. Central Business District, where we are right now, requires site plans. There are other zones uh, that may require site plans, but for the most part, you can see them in the down county area, in particular in the Central Business District. The record plat is the last stage in the planning board approval. After an applicant has approval of the preliminary plan or site plan, they then submit a record plat, which essentially vests the planning board approval of the site plan. Once the record plat's approval, it allows for an applicant to move forward to get their building permit and start construction on the site. Getting through all these steps used to take years, but adding staff, as well as a reorganization of the department, has sped things up. It used to be divided by disciplines, transportation, environmental, historic preservation. Now, staff from the different disciplines work together within geographical regions. And trying to figure out a way to get there. What we've seen is there's more efficiency in the review of plans because people are on the same team. They're working together as a team, getting those plans reviewed quicker. They're also looking at multiple plans at the same time, which allows them to move the process through much faster. So we're seeing more developers come in with joint applications where they're filing maybe a preliminary plan application along with a site plan application. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, we're seeing that because it allows for the developer to move quicker towards getting approval. That helps our process a lot because now staff is looking at one group of plans together when they're reviewing it. We're not looking at one plan and then three months later looking at the same site again for looking at different features. They're looking at the same plan, the same site, and looking at all the features together. So everything is coordinated. It makes for our organization a lot more efficient. It also allows for plans to go quicker to the planning board, get the entitlements, go to record plan and start construction. Patrick Butler is an area planner assigned to Area 2, which is in the central part of the county. He reviews the preliminary plans that are submitted by developers. I'm ensuring consistency with the subdivision regulations and zoning ordinance, um, and then substantial conformance with master plans. Um, on the site plan and the things, we're looking for uh, more of the detailed um, drawings and uh, buildings, um, streetscaping, uh, landscaping, lighting, uh, public use space, uh, those sorts of things. So recently the board approved a preliminary plan and site plan application for Mid Pike Plaza. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, that was approved for a total uh, square footage of 3.4 million square feet, um, roughly half residential, half commercial. Of that uh, commercial use, um, retail, restaurant, movie theater, and uh, other recreational spaces uh, were approved as part of that commercial development. The site plan was approved uh, for phase one of this development, uh, allows for up to 500 uh, residential units, and then uh, 340,000 square feet of those commercial uh, uses for, for phase one. So how is what's proposed for Mid Pike Plaza different from what's there now? We're excited about this project because currently the site's a large uh, parking lot, which will be converted to a vibrant uh, mixed-use center and uh, create attractive places for people who would like to live. And there's another development that came into the board that you reviewed just earlier in February, and that one's the North Bethesda Market 2. So if you could please tell us a little bit about that development as well. Right. Uh, that was approved for a total development of uh, 760,000 square feet. Again, approximately um, half residential, uh, half commercial. A mix of uses envisioned for the site include retail, restaurant, and then uh, public use space to allow for showing of movies or concerts uh, and those types of uh, recreation activities. In the northwest corner of the property is where the residential tower uh, is going to be located. Uh, it'll be 300 feet uh, with the residential units will be south facing an entirely uh, glass wall um, with uh, balconies um, that sort of cascade uh, towards the, the base of the tower. That was kind of an unusual looking rendering. From what I understand, the board was pretty impressed with how that looks. Yeah, it really appears like a, a waterfall, really, as you're looking at it with the sun uh, that will be reflecting off of it. And the way that the uh, balconies uh, step down again towards the base, it really appears as though it's a cascading waterfall. Another project that is poised to begin construction is Falklands Chase. Very near the new transit center in downtown Silver Spring, this development will combine residential and commercial uses in a modern design. The plan incorporates the natural landscape and retains some of the historic buildings, which are garden apartments. The Falklands development was New Deal, social housing, affordable housing. The rents here are more affordable. 
than in, in other areas of, of Silver Spring, and the new, the new development is going to work to, to maintain that. The decision was made to preserve the southern and western portions of Falklands. So the housing, which is very similar to what you see here, uh, will be fully maintained. In fact, there's a, there's a stream that is underground here, but comes out on the south side that will be um, renovated, improved. Elza Heisel McCoy is a planner in Area 1. He says that a key element to this plan is to fit in with the existing environment. The train tracks are right behind us, so that's now the, the CSX um, freight lines and the metro lines, but then the future purple line will also be behind us. So the tallest buildings will be back along uh, the metro, but as the buildings move closer to East-West Highway, they'll come down to a similar scale. These new projects have a few things in common. Each offers a mix of uses that is near transit and adds rental housing, something that's desperately needed in this county. Planning Director Rollin Stanley says they offer one more thing. Beautiful architecture, modern architecture, that's different from what we see in the rest of the county and adds a new dimension. All very dynamic, uh, offering a new product in Montgomery County that we're already hearing that potential people may want to be there as opposed to in D.C. because the product is different than anything else in the region. Do these applications indicate any kind of uptick in the local economy? They certainly do. Uh, we're beginning to come out of the recession. Um, you know, Washington is insulated to some extent to the rest of the country because of the federal government. But we've been particularly hard hit. I mean, things have slowed down. This is showing that people are getting ready for what they see as us coming out of that recession. As the economy picks up, our streamlined review process will help accelerate the approval of exciting new projects, ones that will help transform underused properties into places where people want to be. I'm Susan Kennedy. When Montgomery Plans continues, we'll be talking with Rollin Stanley about the future of Kensington. Stay with us. Have you ever parked illegally in a reserved, accessible parking space? And thought, what's the harm? I'm only going to be a minute. We know how important it is to have reserved parking. And the adjacent striped access aisles provide necessary space needed for assistance devices like my wheelchair and my service dog. Respect the need for reserved parking and the laws that govern its use. On behalf of everyone with accessible plates and placards, we are asking you to respect the space. Rollin, thanks a lot for being with us today. We're in Kensington, and the County Council has just recently approved the sector plan for this community. Tell us a little bit about how that's going to shape the future of this community. Well, the great thing about this is that the plan took a long time, but the wonderful part about it was a real good model of citizen participation, and, and, and a lot changed from our original ideas, particularly places like this. So we are at the crossroads. This is the hub of activity. We all know about the traffic in Connecticut. What can actually happen here? We have a new Safeway here in Kensington, a new one that's being developed in Wheaton. They're very different in style. Tell us about that. Safeway is really starting to look at what they can do with their properties to maximize their, their use. And so in the Wheaton case, we see a 500-unit building going up there. That cannot happen here. The height limits here are pretty much set by the office building at this corner. And so when you look across the street and you see the Safeway newly built, nothing's going to happen to that Safeway for a long, long time. There is potential, however, at that gas station. So you've got the gas station here where we've got a lot of gas stations, and it's not unusual to see those sort of disappear over time as people redevelop. That's probably what would happen here in front of the Safeway. The hardware city now is a different ball of wax. You've got a lot of different leases. These things tend to take a lot longer to develop. And the nice thing about the hardware city is they could do something at the front here before they had to do something at the back. Folks here in the community have been concerned about heights and densities. Again, let's reiterate, nothing would ever be any taller than this building right here. So if we're talking about future development where this gas station is, we're not talking about any kind of a, a, a large structure. No, and that's important. You're talking about five or six story buildings, maybe even four. But you, you, nobody will go above that, one, because the height doesn't allow it, and two, the moment you go above six floors, you go into a different form of construction where you're using steel and concrete and it just doesn't pay to build that kind of a building somewhere between six and eight stories. Okay, so now we're going to go down here and talk a little bit about how we can better use this garage down Connecticut Avenue. So let's take a walk and talk about that. Let's go. 
This is a little precarious getting along here. We have a situation right here where the width of the sidewalk is decreased because of the pole, and this doesn't meet the American Disability Act requirements for persons who are maybe visually impaired or in a wheelchair. Yeah. And even then, look at the traffic zipping by here. Right. And you don't feel safe in this environment. So as we move down and look at here, now this bus goes by. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. And so we need to get this improved. It has to improve because this just is unacceptable over time because there'll be a lot more people walking up here as this area gets a little more active. All right, when you have more shops and more places for folks to visit, you're going to have more foot traffic. Right. So now we see the interface to Warner Street. And this is the parking garage to the office building we were just looking at. But what can happen here? Well, a lot could happen here. The vision we had for here was like townhouses across from the residential acting as the interface to that building. Now, when you think about a townhouse, the property would be about 65 feet deep with a small backyard, so the house itself about 40. Then behind that, you'd have a, a parking structure not dissimilar to this to provide the parking for the office building. And then that creates a better interface. So we're in the nice residential area. And folks in the neighborhood and the community come up with some ideas on how they would like to interface this, their homes with this part of the community. Right, so you've got these great, you know, what Kensington is known for, these lovely single family homes. And here's a case where, like we saw over behind the office building, where you've got a fairly busy street, as you can see, the train station just over here. This is where the, ta the town folks came together and they said, hey, we could have a village center here. And so they're looking at this crossroads, the proximity to the train station, could this become a town center where you have a central park area and some commercial uses that open up onto it, imagine some coffee shops, that sort of thing. And again, uh, not very high, uh, low scale stuff, um, but at an active corner and it would interface well with what we see behind us. So what's really interesting about all of this, you just mentioned the community came up with this idea and, and that's part of what was going on with this planning process. The community was really involved and they really told you what they thought was gonna work best for their community. Absolutely correct, and as we mentioned before, the plan took a while, but it's because as the longer we got into it, more and more people got involved, and new ideas came upon us, and there were great ideas. This interface, this whole village center concept came from the community, and it's a good idea given what the uses are that we were talking about at this location. Great planning at work. Yes. So now we're up at the train station. We've left the uh, village center that the neighbors are proposing, and we're up here at the train station in Kensington, which really isn't used to its fullest capacity. No, that's true. It's not. Um, the estimates range from between 140 and 180 people boarding here each day. And, but it's important to remember that Kensington is here because of this train stop. It's the same thing with Garrett Park. You know, there were street... Uh, train suburbs that allowed people to get on a train get to and from work so there was a time where they were used to a greater extent the good part about it however is some of the property owners in this area see the value in this in particular we see these two house form buildings with the warehouse buildings behind it mm -hmm. known as the Cantera property and they are looking at creating residential units here um, to both access downtown Kensington where we see more um, commercial activity hopefully occurring, but also because of the proximity to the train station. And imagine if you start building condos or rental apartments here, now it's a great selling feature to be this close to the train station. And all of a sudden, this current investment in infrastructure becomes more maximized by people using it more. We need to stress though, we have talked about a lot of things that could be happening here in Kensington, but we're not talking about tomorrow or, or next month. This is a long-term vision for this community. Yes, it's a very long-term vision. It will still remain low density. So it will happen slower than some other places, say uh, like we saw in Silver Spring or Wheaton, where the rules are just completely different. It's lower scale here, it's more neighborhood feel, and it will always be that way. Okay, Roland, thanks so much for this great tour of Kensington. That's it for this episode of Around Town. Maybe we'll be in your neck of the woods next time. Many of Montgomery County's older areas were developed when surfaces were paved without concern for what would happen to rainfall runoff. Today, we know more about how controlling that runoff protects our streams. However, retrofitting stormwater management into already developed areas is a challenge. That is why the county's Department of Environmental Protection partnered with the Department of Transportation to add innovative watershed restoration projects along public right-of-ways. 
To learn more, we met with Mark Wilcox, senior engineer with DEP, at a project along Arcola Avenue in Silver Spring. He began by explaining why we need to control our storm water runoff. Well, we can see in our local tributaries um, to Sligo Creek, to Rock Creek, um, the Anacostia. You can see all that water rushing down um, erodes stream banks, removes vegetation, um, it causes sediment pollution. In addition, erosion in stream banks downstream can cause um, property issues. People lose parts of their yards. Um, more critically, they lo can lose parts of their homes or other structures where the hills are close to the stream. Um, we see sewer pipes, which are typically placed in stream valleys, can be exposed and damaged. And then we have a chance of sewer leakages into creeks. We often don't think about it, but what we throw on the street ends up in the gutter and eventually in their stream. We have cigarette butts, we have old markers, we have a bolt. This is just an example of what ends up in our local streams. The Montgomery County has a permit with the state of Maryland and over the next five years we are asked to control discharges to downstream waterways uh, more aggressively than ever before. So in the past we've traditionally focused on large ponds that collect large drainage areas and treat them collectively um, and somewhat efficiently, but we've over time learned that we can do better. This project is along Arcola Avenue here of uh, the Kemp Mill Shopping Center. We've built about a dozen facilities. Um, they each treat a couple hundred square feet of uh, road surface and uh, other hard surfaces. Um, this is an example of a bioretention stormwater swale. Um, it looks just like a, a landscaped area, but what happens is flow from the ro road right away enters into this facility through these inlets. The, the speed of the water is slowed down by this concrete pad and stone and then the water soaks into this material. There are about two to three feet of this mulch compost sand mixture. Below that is a, a layer of gravel. That gravel stores the water and allows it time to percolate down into the groundwater. When there are very large storm events and this facility is saturated, the excess water will go back into the right of way and continue. But most of the time, this facility will treat all the water that is running off the road. So historically, whenever it rained, all the water from that stoplight to where I'm standing would all come down the hill, down the gutter, and into this catch basin, untreated, and it would discharge into Sligo Creek and in the Anacostia. Now, water is caught and treated by these two stormwater facilities, and water is given a chance to percolate into the ground before it ever enters this catch basin. Here's a good example. Water is split and treated by these two facilities before it ever overflows into this inlet and gets to the creek. Most of these facilities were designed and permitted in a matter of weeks rather than a matter of months. Why are we doing these projects? In order to not only clean up the Chesapeake Bay and downstream tributaries, but to make the local watersheds places where we can live and play again, uh, make them safe for both humans and wildlife. Visit our website at montgomeryplanning.org for complete up-to-date planning information in Montgomery County. There, you'll find ways to access the planning department's many services. You can check out our blogs, see what's going on, submit feedback, and follow us on Facebook. Well, that does it for this edition of Montgomery Plans. Join us again next time when we bring you more on the issues that affect quality of life here in Montgomery County. I'm Michael Brown. Thanks for watching.